So, Bob, here you are in my office. We are. And we're looking at each other across the table. It's true. And we're going to answer some questions from the patrons and see if anyone cares. <laughs> Let's do it. So, uh, Andrea from Mexico says, and actually kind of a sad email here. Mm. My very important and very beloved therapist is dying, oh. and she hasn't cut me out of her life during the process. Mm. Although she officially ended our therapy, mm. um, I'm, I'm very grateful that I'm still a part of her life. Mm. But I don't know how to be there, what to say, and when to reach out. Mm -hmm. The very boundaried and professional therapeutic relationship we had is shifting to a much more personal, human, two-person, caring for each other kind of relationship. I don't know how to manage any of this, and I'm very, very sad. I really don't want her to react to me for my sake, because I am and will be okay. Bob, what do you think? Um, there's something really sweet and lovely about the whole thing. I get, though, that it feels weird that you're, that, that things have shifted in this way, and it seems as though you're relating like two humans here dealing with something about as human as it gets your therapist mortality um i can i can understand the kind of the oddness of it in that you know you don't have a, a sort of a like a script for how this how this what your relationship is now and it's probably be a bit bumpy for both of you at least a little bit bumpy is a bit strong i think actually just sort of like we don't know we don't know right and so i hope that you'll keep talking about it because you know, to some degree, they, she's still your therapist, right? I mean, mm. you know, like once, I, I always think once I'm somebody's therapist, I'm in my heart, I'm always mm -hmm. the therapist. So, so my guess is there's probably room for that dynamic. And it's very clear to me that you care a great deal about your therapist and um, wish to be a source of comfort and support for her um, um, and wish to avoid being, you know, uh, a distraction for her while she's, you know, dying. Yeah. Um, and, um, I, you know, talk about it. Yeah. That's what I would do. Yeah. Um, to piggyback on that, what I'll say is do what feels right to you, Andrea. Yeah. If you want to reach out, reach out. It sounds like you do. And is that a song lyric? If you want to reach out, reach out. If you want to did I get, oh, it's Cat Stevens. Cat Stevens, yeah. Um, and also, I wouldn't worry about professional boundaries because that's over. Mm -hmm. uh, your relationship as a therapist th a client is, is officially over, mm -hmm. although uh, ethically speaking, that's never really over. But the, given the circumstances, uh, you know, she, your therapist doesn't care about losing her license at this point. Right? <laughs> and... Two, it, it it wouldn't happen anyway. Like if if you if something weird happened and you made a complaint, uh, I cannot imagine the uh, you know state board or uh, a court of law saying that the therapist somehow harmed you, you know, in this process. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, without knowing more details, mm -hmm. um, but at the very uh, least that's not your responsibility. Mm -mm. You as a client are not, and too many clients worry about this. They're just like, I don't want to violate the therapist's boundaries. You know, there are a few exceptions to that. Like don't show up at their house. For example, if they're with their kids at the park, you know, don't approach them. Uh, if you're a client, mm -hmm. you know, just, just those kinds of things, but asking to hang out, you know, Andrea, if you're just like, Oh, you know, I want, I want to, I'm, I'm just thinking about my therapist who is in hospice right now. I, I want to reach out, I, but I don't want to cross boundaries, you know, just reach out. The, the, the other thing I'll say is from personal experience, I hadn't really thought about it till just now is I had a friend actually who I worked with at my very first therapy job post-grad and he was in charge of the domestic violence um, program and we would talk for hours and hours. You know, it was one of those things where in between clients, we would just bop into each other's office. He, he was, uh, I don't know, 20 years older than me or something, but I, I just remember really bonding with him. And he, uh, 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 late 40s, early 50s, had some kind of lung disease that occurred very quickly, and mm -hmm. he 
left sick. I remember he, he said, I said, he's like, yeah, I just feel really, I've been dealing with this sickness for like a month. I just have not been recovering. Mm. And then I heard that he was uh, extremely sick and in the hospital and, and might be dying. And so I called him because I wanted to reach out. You know, I had a question of just like, well, am I crossing some sort of boundary? But I called him and I think his wife answered the phone and said, who's this? I said, you know, this is Kirk, his, his coworker. And she didn't know me, sure. but uh, they, the wife, or maybe he said or something, but they were very abrupt with me. They were like, uh, he's dealing with something right now he can't really talk by. You know, it was very, very quick. Oh, wow. But totally get it. You know, he, he could have been wheezing yeah. he could have been right. being transported from one room to another right. he could have been pre-surgery post-surgery right he could have been just not interested in talking to some you know co-worker of her mm-hmm. of his and uh i get that so but i don't regret it no i don't regret calling him. no of course not and uh, uh because as you were saying, Bob, it's a messy situation. How, how are you supposed to know what to do? It's not yeah. going to be clean. No. It's there's not going to be an invitation sent to you. You know. Yeah. Uh, so, I recommend reaching out in ways that allow the your therapist to say, I, I I can't really talk right now. You know, don't just show up at the hospital, for example. You know, but calling, texting, emailing, that kind of thing. And in all likelihood, they'll appreciate it. Uh, worst case scenario, they're just busy and they'll just say, not right now. Yeah. And, and uh, I recommend that for really all sorts of situations. I think uh, in a lot of cultures, we're too concerned about politeness yeah. and boundaries yeah. and cleanliness in these situations. And life is not about that. And I don't know anyone on their deathbed is just like, oh, I'm so glad I avoided humiliating myself in those kinds of situations you know like i don't know if anyone is uh, uh happy that they were careful mm. in those situations so you know uh do do what feels right to you and right and i'm just really sorry that you're going through that it's yeah. it's very it's a huge loss and i'm really glad that your therapist is mm. allowing that to happen i i know a lot of therapists that will do that though mm-hmm. yeah they'll uh, stay in contact as they're as they're dying. Invite mm-hmm. them to the funeral, that kind mm-hmm. of thing. And I think that it's like the last gift a therapist can give their clients. Mm-hmm. Listener Danny said, "She says I was contacted by a social worker regarding getting therapy. Mm-hmm. I explained my issues and how I deal with being unable to cope with my feelings of day to day life." They told me that unless I have practiced healthy coping mechanisms for six months, I am not allowed to meet with a therapist. Is this a regular practice thing, or does this seem odd in your opinion? Bob, what do you think? Based on what I'm hearing here, it seems very odd. Yeah. Like, there's no assessment, but there's this prescription of something about coping. I I sort of think that um, that would be a therapist wheelhouse. If somebody actually (laughs) needs help coping, you know, why not roll your sleeves up, pitch in, give give some help? Yeah. Um, I've done that many times. Um, So that seems rather odd. Now, you're, if I heard this right, uh, this social worker called Danny up and basically to say, I'm not going to be your therapist. You should do coping. Uh, it's, I say I was contacted by a social worker regarding getting therapy, explained my issues and how I deal with. Uh, and then they told me that unless I have practiced healthy coping mechanisms for six months, I'm not allowed to meet with a therapist. Huh. Yeah, uh, it's hard to imagine why a social worker would just call someone out of the blue, but uh, I'm assuming that There's Danny kind of... just connected with a social worker or something. And somehow, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Danny, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what country you're in. You know, yeah. that, that can be a factor as well. But as you're saying it, as Bob was saying, yeah, this is 100% odd and unethical potentially. Mm. Uh, if you have a broken arm and you go to the ER and they're just like, come back to us after the after the bone has fixed itself. Uh, that's essentially <laughs> what this person is saying to you. Yeah. Uh, you know, six months of coping skills. That's why I'm calling a therapist. Right. You, you numbskull. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, it's victim blaming. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, I don't know if it was some other kind of issue. Like some, sometimes there are, and I'm not this way, but there are uh, pr- practices that therapists will engage in where they'll be like, they'll detect 
say that you're an addict or something you're and you, you're not sober mm-hmm. and so they'll say you got you got to get sober mm. i will work with people like that because i think that therapy can help with sobriety in yeah. you know efforts <laughs> and often uh you know substance use is due to traumas and whatnot yeah. and 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 disconnection from humans so uh but yeah on the surface uh it sounds ridiculous sounds weird yeah uh, question for Bob from Soft Noodles, uh, annual patron Soft Noodles from Discord. Hmm. She says, uh, I have a question for Bob. I am almost 25 and I have a fair dose of childhood trauma mm-hmm. that has shaped me in some fundam- very fundamental ways. I'm going to therapy and doing my best to heal, but the idea that this is my life truly feels devastating to me at times. Mm. It feels unfair and cruel and sad that my symptoms are so constant and brutal. My trauma makes me miss out on a lot of the things that make life work worth living, and sometimes I feel like there is no point and I want to give up. In my efforts to not give up and somehow embrace my life as it is, I have been thinking about how it feels like I'm in this ongoing grief process about all this. Mm. I wanted to ask Bob, do you grieve your childhood trauma and the impact it has had on your life? Are there things you do to make meaning out of all of it? For sure, all of that. Yeah, grieve. Um, I can't say that I experience sadness the way I used to about what happened to me. Um, there are ways in which I'm impacted now that make me frustrated, angry sometimes, lots of shame. Well, what are you going to do, right? Tremend- uh, good amount of fear and a uh, good amount of sadness. I was, um, about three weeks ago, I was sitting with this couple who both are childhood trauma survivors. They're really lovely. They've been together for half their lives and they're young people. They're in their mid thirties. And I said to them, if you never, if you chip away at your connection with one another, you just keep chipping away at it because it's very hard for them. They they love each other. They really adore one another. They like being together. They they it's a beautiful little family they've got there, and um, they are both reticent and can be with withdrawing. Not not ill tempered or anything like that, but just like. Um, um, distant. Um, and I said, so if you chip away at that, will it have been a life worth living? And they both were very immediate to say, absolutely, absolutely mm-hmm. a life worth living. So I, I think about that. I think, and I, you know what I said to them? I said, me too. I chip away at me and I agree. It's a life worth living. So I know you're 25, right? I know you're in a lot of pain and I'm very sorry about that. And I believe you can make a life worth living. And, you know, like, it's a tough truth. Like Kirk has said this here to me. He said this on the podcast, I'm sure, many times, is that once touched like that, you probably are going to be chipping away at it forever. And you may never cross some finish line or whatever that is anymore. But that's okay. That's okay. You can make a life worth living. Um, I'd be kind of curious to see what you say to yourself in five years in your efforts to do that. Hang in there. Mm. Keep going. Mm. You'll be all right. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if you'll be all right. I think if you keep going, you'll find peace. Uh, You'll find bumps. Yup. And I think ultimately you'll be glad you did. It's beautiful. Thank you. What meaning? You sort of answered it, but just to be more specific, what meaning do you make out of all of it? Yeah, me. Like, you know, my whole work field, my whole work choice is is, um, making lemonade out of a lemon. Um, good thing about being a trauma survivor, at least this trauma survivor, um, is it has informed um, some capacities I have as a therapist. I don't know what I'd be like otherwise. Nobody can know, but I think um, um, there's a kind of empathy that um, I have that I don't know that I would have if I weren't. That doesn't mean it's good to be a trauma survivor. It isn't. And if I had my druthers, I would not be. Um, But... Uh, one of the meanings I make out of the things I went through is it gives me a capacity to relate to people who've gone through and chewed similar dirt. Um, and uh, I do mostly couple therapy these days. And so I find that I can more, I can relate to each person's struggle, even when their struggle seems in opposition to one another. Like it's a, it's apparent to me how people make sense. 
even when they do behaviors that um, keep them stuck in their conflict, um, how those behaviors are an attempt to have connection or have a sense of safety in the connection. And um, um, given that that happens to me a lot, or I find myself, let's see, how do I want to say this? Mm, feeling angsty. I have a part of me that's sort of withdrawing, and I have a part of me that's sort of pursuing, and I have a part of me that's sort of frozen. Um, when I come across withdrawing, when I come across pursuing, and when I come across, across freezing, I get it. I get what that's like, and um, it's useful to be able to frame that. So I said to this one guy about, I don't know, two months ago, I'm like, he, he's a trauma survivor, uh, childhood trauma, um, and he witnessed a lot of domestic <laughs> violence. Um, I said, it's like you're in a trench and the bullets and the bombs are whizzing by and you got somebody in the trench with you. And when you're that scared, you don't have the capacity to look over and say, Hey, how's your day? (laughs) All you're trying to do is just get through the day. And that's what it's like for you in your relationship with your partner. And he said, nobody ever said that to me before. That's Mm. exactly what it's like. That was that was good, 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 um, good moment because it it's validating of what how he feels and it makes sense of what he finds himself doing, which is you know pretty pretty withdrawn but, and incurring a lot of complaints from partners yeah. that are saying you're withdrawn. Yeah, exactly. And and you're like, oh, there must be something wrong. With right, me. right. Which yeah. I think you know he probably has a corner of his brain that gets critical like that, but but. It is. It's like bullets and bombs whizzing by his head all the time. Yeah. So um, that's useful. Do you tell your clients that you were traumatized? Yeah. I I don't make a thing of it, but yeah. Uh, If I think it's relevant, absolutely. How do you make meaning out of the fact that you were traumatized and I wasn't? Not us specifically, but like that some people just roll the dice and come up with snake eyes and others get a seven. Um. I think, well, I mean, I could put myself on a continuum. The thing I went through is it was, it was tough and it wasn't the worst thing a person can suffer. Mm -hmm. I I do have a sense of perspective. Um, there's, there's, there, it could be far more worse for me than, than, than what it has been. And people in this world have much harder time than I do. So I think it's a question of perspective. I don't really feel snake eyes. Okay. But, you know, for people like Danny, or sorry, soft noodles, who suffer daily. Yeah. And others like me, just sort of whistling through life, you know, privileged and not traumatized in this way anyway. (laughs) uh, How do you, do you ever think about that? Do you ever think like, why did I get the short end of the stick in this situation? I don't even know if you see it that way, but I, I don't actually, I don't have, I mean, I love you, but I don't envy, I don't have envy. <laughs> um, the, the thing that I, one of the things I value in our friendship is that, um, you provide a little bit of perspective and, um, um, a sense of what else is possible because in my little myopic worldview, I can start to see things a certain way. And then, and then you come along and you're like, oh, you mean you don't feel safe? Like literally, you don't, oh, that makes me sad. I'm like, oh, you mean people do feel safe, <laughs> right? It's like, I forgot <laughs> or I don't know. So, so um, I don't have envy for you. And um, I appreciate though that you show me um, that there's more to life than what my eyes are used to seeking so there was never a point where you thought how come even in your own family really how come i was the targeted one and my little brother wasn't you know that that never you never wrestled with that they all got it okay or the next door family didn't get it you know like yeah no i never did you never did no yeah no actually i think when i was young i presumed everybody was afraid of their dad oh yeah I had, I remember when I was 23, I had this friend and her dad worked at this office and my dad worked at an office and they wore the same kind of shoes. They wore those clunky wingtip shoes. You know what those look like? Yeah. 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 
and she'd say, I'd, I'd be home and I'd hear the sound of my dad's footsteps coming up the driveway and coming into the house and the clump, clump, clump. And it would just fill me with joy. And I was like, geez, I heard that same thing. It used to scare the hell out of me. Huh. Right. It was quite something to think that there's more to experiencing than, than my quote normal. Yeah. Yeah. I think I might have gone on a little bit of a tangent there. No. By the way, Soft Noodles, annual patron Soft Noodles, won the Discord Commenter Award this year. Really? Yeah. What, what's the Discord Commenter Award? Uh, I'm not sure yet, but oh. I'm going to send Soft Noodles something very soon. <laughs> so congratulations to Soft Noodles for uh, being nominated by the other Discord people as very kind and very active mm. and very helpful oh. um, and engaging That's nice. and again, nice because, uh, you know, online commenting isn't always Ooh. nice. No. Hang uh, in there. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. Hang in there. Patron cat from Ontario says, when I cry, my fiance seems to be at a loss and mm. not comforting at all. Mm. Do I need to be a better communicating? Do I need to be better at communicating my needs? I mm. have trouble knowing my needs, or mm. does this reveal his discomfort of being vulnerable in situations? What's a way to manage this? I have I have more of an avoidant attachment style. Mm. Evidently, therapy has softened me a bit because I used to never cry, mm. but I can't say I don't feel any less alone now that I am crying more. Bob, what do you think? I think that it might be that your partner is scared and um, doesn't know what to do and perhaps feels pressure to respond a certain way or maybe even has a sense of wishing to escape from something that is dangerous. I know it's not dangerous, but, you know, bodies and all. Sometimes they'll respond that way. And perhaps um, doesn't see your relationship as a resource for him or her when you're having tears. Like, just because you're having tears doesn't mean that they don't still have need. What I've been noticing with couples lately is that when the one partner can um, slow it down and address the fact that they, not, they don't see their relationship as a resource for them but think that they're called to do something, if they can slow that down and, and recognize, oh, I've, the road's bumpy right now. I need something. I need shock absorbers or whatever. And um, turn to partner that even in the midst of sadness, um, um, partner has perhaps uh, a capacity to provide the kind of reassurance that's needed so that my body can settle down and I can be present for you when you're crying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'll say in piggyback to that is get, go to therapy. Uh, Kat, yeah. Uh, Cause that is a perfect place to be working on this sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're in couples therapy and you're crying and your fiance seems to not be helpful one the therapist might notice it too you could just be like i don't feel like he's being very helpful this yeah. is like a something that comes up and then the therapist can turn to your fiance and say what's going on when mm -hmm. you see your spouse crying like that right uh you say do i need to be better at communicating my needs you know maybe maybe uh it, as bob was saying uh, crying is one thing and you would hope that your spouse would attune to that and care I, I mean, not care, ex express caring. He probably yeah, does care. Probably cares a lot, yeah. Uh, but maybe there are things you can say, like, I'm crying because of this, or mm -hmm. I'm not crying because of this. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no threat here. And as Bob was saying, usually people are afraid of something. Mm -hmm. And say, does this reveal his discomfort uh, of being in vulnerable situations? Probably. Yeah. Uh, what's a way to manage this? Um, you know, I just, I think Bob answered that yeah. question. Uh, okay. F uh, listener Madison says, I'm a junior in high school taking a college psychology class. Wow. What was your favorite topic to learn when you were in college? Bob, what do you think? Oh, I think college was wasted on me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I liked research when I was in school. I oh, liked really? research methods. Yeah. That was really interesting to and me. Your BA? Yeah. My BS. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't take any. Did you get psychology? Bachelor's? Yeah, I have a bachelor's in psychology. Oh, okay. Yeah. If I could do it over again, um, I would um, study development and developmental theory more with an eye on attachment. But they didn't really talk about attachment 
um, in my bachelor's program, or if they did, I didn't really understand what they were saying. It was um, probably more like an intellectual concept than it was an yeah. actual, you know, real important thing. Yeah. The way that attachment theory is almost always taught, it's this, uh, uh, it's like, you know, it only applies to two year olds, is the way it's often portrayed. Yeah. And it's very dry yeah. and very, uh, you know, brief in the midst of 10 other developmental theories that yeah. they'll go over. Right. And I think uh, completely misses the point. You know, when I started to do my deep dive on mm -hmm. it and other, uh, you know, endeavors of learning it, I was like, wait a second, this applies to everything. Like yeah. literally everything I do when I'm at work, when I'm on the road and I see another driver, it all has to do with fear and attachment and bonding and mm -hmm. security. Everything I am, all, all my emotions, you know, most of my, not all my emotions, but most of my emotions are all related to attachment reactivity. You yeah. know, it's all there. Yeah. And it's so elegant, you know, working model of self and other, and you yeah. don't have to get into the weeds with a psychodynamic theory. You can just you can just focus on understandable language and yeah. understandable mechanisms of development and, yep. and neuronal development. Anyway, uh, so that was in your bachelor's. What about in your master's? In master's, what did Favorite I like? Class. Favorite class, master's. Oh, ethics was cool. Um, 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 group therapy. That was that was tough. Who'd that, you have? Uh, Sandra Wood. Sandra okay. Wood. Yeah. Um, oh, oh. Um, Dan Kelleher taught a class, but I don't remember what it was called. But it had to, it was more transpersonal. I think it was sort of transpersonal, but I, I couldn't even tell you what that class was. I just dig him, and that was a good class. I have to go look it up. Sex was kind of cool. Yeah, um, we were in that class human, together. Yeah, we were. Human sexuality, that was kind of cool. Um, you didn't like that uh, development class that we took where we wrote the myth? Weren't you in that class Oh, I was. Yeah. I Because um, <laughs> that was a weird no, class. That was a weird class. We, I, we read Irvin. Um, yeah, uh, John Irving. John Irving. Prayer for Owen Meaning. I yeah. had already read it three times, so I didn't have to. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if I've ever admitted this, but I didn't really read that book. Yeah. Because it's, I, I read so slow. Mm. And it's, it's, you know, it's a full novel. It's a big one. Yeah. It's like, you know, 350 pages kind yeah. of a thing. And yeah. I think I like got, I don't know, 50 pages in. And I was just like, oh, yeah. like, really? I have to read this whole thing? Yeah. You know, because usually when you're assigned reading, it's uh, a lot of reading, but it's not like 350 pages of dense material yeah you know what i mean no um anyway uh, i've since seen a play of the prayer of oh yeah at book at theater actually it was just the christmas scene yeah. uh, which is a famous right. little bit in the book mm -hmm. and i thought that the person that they picked to play owen meany did not fit the bill because mm. the picture in your head of who owen meany was was just was very almost like maybe there's no human that could actually play that character. Yeah. Um, but anyway, my favorite yeah. bachelor's class, um, I don't know. I mean, I remember a lot of it. I, I, I went, I was started engineering and took, you know, chemistry and math and physics and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, liked it actually. The math class was really dry. Mm -hmm. We had a, uh, TA who was a terrible teacher. Uh, but what are you going to do? Yeah. Right. And then I switched to business because mm -hmm. I didn't know what else to choose. And I, right. I just, I, I wanted something that was applicable after graduation. And it was, you know, I, I'm, I'm in business now, you know, <laughs> and I took a lot of accounting and finance mm -hmm. and economics mm -hmm. and marketing. I liked the marketing side, but my favorite classes in, um, in my bachelor's degree, probably my music class. So with all my elective electives, I, and there were a fair amount with mm -hmm. a liberal art or was, as a business degree. But anyway, there were a fair amount of, I remember there were two full quarters of music classes. I saved up all of my electives for my last couple quarters. Wow. And I took two full loads of just music courses. That's awesome. Yeah. And one of the classes was composition. And I sat in a small circle with 
three or four other students and we just like talked about how to write songs. That's cool. And I was completely a fish out of water because everyone was was classical and classically trained. You know, these are all music majors who are training about to be conductors right. and stuff and, you know, to be like pianists at the in the symphony and, yeah. and I'm just here with my acoustic guitar and I'm not even particularly good at acoustic guitar and uh, I'm writing songs and having to transcribe it by hand. You know, this is before computers. So I'm transcribing all my music by, I have to like pick it out and figure out, is that, okay, that's an A and is that a dotted quarter? No, I don't even know, yeah. you know, I didn't write it all out <laughs> because which is so stupid. It's like, can't you just evaluate a song? Can I just play it for you? Cause that's what I would end up, you know, doing and the right. teacher, I just remember he'd just be rolling his eyes. Like, why is this guy in my class? Oh, that's yeah. Too bad. It wasn't very accepting. Let's just put it that way. That sucks. At the time they, they looked down at jazz, you know, the, uh, this is early nineties. So jazz, jazz was considered like the new kid on the block. That was not real music. You know what I mean? Snobs. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh my God, Bob, you do. I mean, have you, do you know the snobbery that it is in? Have you seen whiplash, the movie whiplash? I, I know that story. I didn't watch that film. It That's an extreme version of it, but that's a manifestation. And that is jazz. And even jazz in school can, can be extremely elitist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it, it's, um, you know, I don't know what, why it, it, it start, you know, why it ended up that way, but, um, there's so much snobbery in these music departments and competition and lack of mutual support. And uh, my impression is that there's so few paying jobs. Yeah. And there's not a lot of money to be made you know, that like you, you have to f scrap and fight and yeah. compete, compete and, and, and push people aside as you get to the prize mm. and uh yeah and i think it's just a culture of that as well yeah. it just it, there's just a like the way that there's a culture i don't know if it's still that way in the medis medical field yeah. where when you're starting out you, you get weeded out right. or when you're at residency you're they work you 24 7 literally right. mm. because well that's what we did when we and even the research shows that those kinds of practices actually cause more accidents and more death to patients. Yeah. Like science has proven yeah. 20 hour shifts are yeah. bad for everyone. Yeah. So stop it. <laughs> and yet they keep doing it. Mm -hmm. At least that's my take on my understanding. Pretty of sure the research. they still do it. Yeah. But, it, but it's a cultural manifestation. It's just like, well, this is what you do. This is what you do. Yeah. The way that like high school start at seven 30, even though the research says like, that's just not humane. <laughs> uh, teenagers, are the one group of humans on the planet that uh, their circadian rhythm is is shifted into uh you know meaning that they they wake up they their body wants to wake up at like nine, nine. or eight or something yeah. maybe 10 right. and yet they're the ones that are getting up at six o'clock and right. climbing on the bus at, right. you know so in uh and then music anyway. So I really liked composition. There was also a computer music class that I took, you know, we, we programmed in C plus and it was, uh, you know, computers are so slow back then mm -hmm. that we would program a song, uh, using, you know, C plus it's just, you know, have you, you know, like if you've ever programmed in that basic kind of language, and then I would, we would set it, and then the next day we'd get to listen to the song because it would take all night to process. And it was so interesting because you you do all these algorithm equations that would change figures. So you're literally uh, typing in math equations to create the the sound wave. Um, you're not like saying play A, B, and C. You would have to dial in the exact hertz of A, B, and C, and in and the um, the harmonics in that, like everything, it was very wow. um, advanced, really. Yeah. And uh, I learned a lot about music and computers yeah. during that. That, um, and there were some p classmates of mine that were just geniuses. I mean, because I basically created this song that was this wispy kind of musical 
you know, five minute thing. Like it wasn't really a song. It was more like sound effects in a way, you know, like, (laughs) but this one guy created like a full on song with like chords and a beat and in algorithm form. And I just thought like, how did you do that? Trippy. Um, I liked chemistry. I liked astronomy. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, 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 in high school, I took, uh, with my electives, I took advanced chemistry just for fun. Just for fun. And physics. I didn't have to take it, but wow. I, I liked it. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> it's fun. I think chemistry and physics I find to be extremely interesting. I, um, I think I've talked about this podcast before, but there was a, a day when I would buy physics and chemistry textbooks from like Goodwill and I would just read them while I ate breakfast. You know, the way people read yeah, like a the newspaper. newspaper or something. I'm, I'm, I'm just reading a textbook on on chemistry or something. You right know? on. And, and, and to this day in YouTube, there's all these really great YouTube channels where they will talk about the newest research from, you know, dark matter or, you know, super clusters of galaxies and I'll just sit there for 45 minutes and just watch this dude talk about uh, those kinds of things. Do you, are you interested in that kind of stuff? seems like you would I'd be say casually. I'm interested in that sort of thing. Like astronomy yeah. and yeah. 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 But not as much as me. I uh, no, 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 definitely not. Yeah. Plus YouTube is, that's what I use when I want to figure out how to plumb. YouTube for me, I, in the last few years, like it's become my main entertainment yeah you don't watch tv you watch youtube yeah yeah i mean i do watch tv but if i'm just kind of chilling at night you know yeah. stacy goes to bed before i do and so I'll, I'll just i'll just i i watched what did i watch yesterday i watched a guy make a uh at home he made a tv projector a 4k projector he made one he made one you can't make those you have to go to sony <laughs> <laughs> He made it out of like aluminum pipes and he got an old cell phone off of eBay. And because if you take the cell phone screen, it's see-through. And if you, if, cause that's how cell phones are, there's a backlight on those things. Right. And so if you get a, anyway, point is, is that from, I watched 45 minutes of him just making, and he also made this, I forget his name, I should plug him, but he also made this um, computer that instead of using fans, it had this like bellow system that kind of breathed in and out, and, you know, because you need your, you need air to come yeah. in and out of, out of your computer case. Right. And he created this bellow, but he needed it to be as silent as possible. So he created these like magnets and this pump system. And I don't know. Point is, is that I'm a nerd and I watch nerd That's shit. That's amazing. Um, let's take a break and we get back more questions. What do you say? I say yes. Hey, Deserving Listeners, as y'all know, I am constantly recommending that people go to therapy. We all need therapy from time to time. Well, one of the options available that is definitely worth checking out is BetterHelp. If you're looking for a therapist, I would give it a try by going to betterhelp.com slash Kirk. Make sure you use the promo code Kirk because you get 10% off your first month and it really helps us out. As you watch these videos, I know many of you have been motivated to find your own therapist, which is great because you deserve it. And I know also that it can be hard to find a good fit, find the right one for you. Well, one of the options available in terms of your shopping is to go to betterhelp.com slash Kirk. I've been told you can start communicating with your therapist in under 24 hours. You can message your counselor at any time. Plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. I've also been told that it's often less expensive than in-person therapy, and you should know that this service is available to clients worldwide. So go to betterhelp.com slash Kirk to get 10% off your first month today. All right, we're back from the break. So I thought we'd do an OPP, which is an old patron praise. These people became patrons way back when, and I like to highlight them for sticking around through thick and thin. Right on. You know, being not just patrons, but patrons for a long period of time. Because, you know, that's that's the whole model, is like when you become a patron, you support for, you know, um, however long it makes sense to, 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 to you know, like I, I will give money to podcasts and uh, it feels good to feel like I'm helping them continue like yeah you know forever kind of thing yeah but anyway 
so these people became patrons back in January of 2019. Wow. So almost three years ago. Yeah. And have stayed patrons this entire time. And I'm going to read their names. So yeah. we have CW from Bra- from Bone, Denmark, or Bone, Germany. We got five from God knows where. We have Christian from Wenatchee. Have you ever been to Wenatchee, Washington? I think so. Yeah, it's, it's you drive through it on your way to Chelan. If you've been to Chelan, you've yeah. been to Wenatchee. Yeah. Um, I have family from out there from, um, from Yakima and Wapato. So Wenatchee is true to my heart. We have Ash- Ashili from God Knows Where. We have Hannah from Sweden. And we have Bob Gettle. Ooh. Did you know that you became a patron in 20 of 19? Oh, I thought it was earlier than that. No kidding. Yeah. I'm still a patron, guys. Yeah. You're an, and now. you're an I'm, annual patron. I'm an annual patron. Yeah. And we got Autumn, who's also an autumn pa- uh, annual patron. Autumn mm-hmm. we've communicated with before. We got Rich from God Knows Where. We have Susan. We have Mary Ellen, who was an annual patron from... New Jersey. I've interacted with Mary. We got Angie from Tallahassee, uh, Carlin from Toronto, Kimberly from Boise. Uh, did you know Boise is the new like hip place that everyone's moving to? I, I think I knew that. Have you been to Boise? I don't. No, I don't even I know, know if I'm pronouncing it right, but I think I am. Uh, I'm just amazed that Boise, because to me. I, you know, no offense to Boise people, but at least the last time I was there, I was just like, yeah, that's a fine rural town in the middle of nowhere. But apparently it's like the new hip place that all the young millennials are moving to. They They're moving be. from California wow. to Boise, you know, because uh, house prices are lower. Da, da, da. Anyway, yeah. Uh, Jessica from Troy, Ohio. Mm. Tara from God knows where. Phil from Seattle. Hey, annual. Phil patron ellie from god knows where and we also got tomcat who is another discord person from australia so uh they became a patron back then we have rebecca we have uh we have actually someone else that i can't say for ethical reasons (laughs) we have allison from georgia we have annette who is an annual patron from connecticut we have a lot of patrons who sign up in January 2019. I wonder what was happening then. Very popular. Uh, Marita from Illinois. Benjamin from God Knows Where. Anne from Nevada. Jessica from Minnesota. Lakeville, Minnesota. Claire from God Knows Where. Jesse from Jackson, Tennessee. Carolyn. Uh, Pete from Burbank, California. Ashley from Texas. Pamela from God Knows Where. Siamak from California, Lakeside. And Brianna from Seattle. So that is a long list. That's a long. That's the longest one I've seen. <laughs> I think it, it might be the longest list. Although coming up when I'm lo- I'm sort of scrolling down. Yeah. In March of 2019 is when the attachment deep dive came out, uh-huh. and so there's a huge list of people in in March of 2019 that became patrons and have and have remained patrons. But anyway, right on. so thank you all for being a patron and also just sticking around all this time because, you know. That means a lot to me and Bob. So let's read another email here after I make sure that I organize my thing here. Uh, uh, Patron Cotty Wample, who is also a Discord guardian. Uh, She says, my fiance and I play mixed doubles pickleball. Have you ever played pickleball before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my neighbor had a pickleball court. So I played a fair amount of pickleball when I was a kid. My fiance and I play mixed doubles pickleball at public courts, and I almost always have male opponents come up to me after the games who say, I have some advice for you. My partner and I have similar abilities on the court, yet he rarely, if ever, has had other males coming up to him give, to give him advice. I have never had a woman offer advice unless I asked for it. Mm-hmm. I, fi- I found this sexist, sexist but was curious about the psychology behind men giving unsolicited advice to women. What do you think, what do they want out of this interaction? Appreciation, superiority? Bob, what do you think? I, that's a great question. I think it's like an ego thing, right? I, yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe they want to think they did a good thing, or maybe they do want appreciation or adoration, or maybe they like the validation that they give themselves by offering good advice or something. Um, there's definitely a cultural thing, you know, the mansplaining yeah. that, that we do. 
I think it comes down to this uh, orientation to life that when men in certain contexts, and really this is, you could apply this to women in certain contexts too, but I'll stick with men for now, mm. which are much more prevalent than for women, mm -hmm. that for some men, when they see people doing things that are making mistakes or they're struggling with something, mm -hmm. there's this orientation that uh, men in general will take, which is, oh, I need to help with that. Yeah. Whereas, uh, like, if I'm driving through Boise, for example, or walking, and I see someone lost, I don't, I don't have an orientation to help that person because I don't know where I am either. But if I'm in Seattle, I used to live downtown, down by the Space Needle, mm -hmm. and there were a lot of tourists, and I would see people literally walking on the street with that tourist map. You, have you oh, seen yeah. that tourist map that well, they give out? Yeah. It's sort of a cartoony map. Yeah. And I would see people having it unfolded and they'd just be looking around and I'd be just walking to work. And so I would walk up to them and say, hey, can I help you? Because I usually could. Mm -hmm. And because the cartoon map wasn't extremely helpful. No. You know what I mean? It yeah. was hard to orient yourself. And I'd be like, okay, you go down here. Right. And so I was oriented in a way that was, it's sort of my job to help, right? Um, so I think that for men in, in a non-misogynistic sexist way you know you have a plumber regardless of gender and they walk by someone who's trying to do plumbing then they just think oh well i should help it you know that that that's it's it's courteous it's the right thing to do it's moral when someone is struggling um now you have to have other factors in there Cody wample i think to uh, result in what you've experienced because they're not reaching out to your husband or your partner, your fiance. Yeah. Um, and that is that when women are making mistakes, uh, so, so there's a lot of message that could be at play. All of them could be at play. One, you don't correct men. Men don't correct men in general because there's a competition problem and you might feel like you're hurting their ego. You know, a, a man would know another man would maybe take issue with being given adv unsolicited advice. Yeah. Whereas women, you know, men are taught that women are incompetent and and know they're incompetent and know that they uh, should receive advice. And women are, you know, men are socialized to believe that women are not really a competition. You're not really in competition with men, with women, because they're they're lesser. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm hmm. Uh, another message that men are given is that you're supposed to dominate women yeah. and it, to do this is to, you know, even just to be in that mindset of, you know, I'm playing against this man and this woman and there's a woman, you know, one of the things you might <laughs> take note of Cotty Wample is when you beat them, do they give you more advice? Cause are they trying to make up for the fact that you beat them or something? Uh, Another thing that's at play is men are taught they're supposed to sexually dominate women. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that unless you interact with them. <laughs> and so this could be like some, uh, you know, foray into that area where they, they, they just feel like they need to sexually dominate you and, or they, they want to sexually dominate you or, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. Um, Appreciation as well, you know, they're just looking to to be helpful or yeah. something. But um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's awful, you know. I, it'd be fine if someone offers help, but like with me, I as an Asian person, white people from a certain place in our culture will walk up to me and you know and say, "What are you?" or "Where are you from?" or mm. "Where are your parents from?" and and it's like the act is not horrible you know there's curious but when you add up yeah. all the bucking white people in my life yeah, particularly yeah. as i step outside seattle or the west coast mm -hmm. and ask me like you know they look at my eyes and my skin tone and they're like where are you from it it all adds up to racism yeah. and xenophobia and particular brand of it which is that if you're asian you're foreign and yeah. you're a stranger you're like this weird elf that like emerged <laughs> from space or something it's like we're fucking humans that, yeah. that emigrated like you fuckers did you yeah. know what i mean like yeah. it's not any different than you so stop 
uh, fetishizing me. You know, right. I'm, I'm I'm fourth generation American. You know, like yeah. uh, my my family fought in all the wars. You know, uh, um, anyway, point is, and that's not true. That I, it's, what's weird is that in the you know main American wars, I have relatives, white relatives, that fought in all the old ones, but none of none of my relatives fought in World War II or Vietnam. And maybe even World War One, Korea, and not Korea, because mm -hmm. the well, Korea there wasn't as much of a of a draft as there was with Vietnam, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think I think Korea was a lot of just uh, career army people, Marines and stuff. But uh, the draft would be the problem, you know, would be the thing right. and the joining, and my. Uh, the men in my family were aged just perfectly to avoid all those wars. Oh, you yeah. know, like my grandfather was, I think, in his 30s during World War Two. And my dad was uh, in his 20s married with kids yeah. during Vietnam, Vietnam, which would which negated you yeah. from from selective service. Right. Right. Select service. Selective service? Selective service, correct. Anyway, but the, uh, you know, the revolution, American Revolution, the Civil War, all those I have relatives in. Um, so stop asking me where the fuck I'm from. I'm from here. Um, so, you know, on behalf of men, uh, Cotty Wample, I deeply apologize for, me too. for our uh, gender. We're j idiots. You know, it's just stupid like you know what i really like though that they're writing in and asking this question it's a good reminder and it's also good that we keep talking about it so that we don't so that we have a possibility of waking up or staying awake yeah yeah patron lenny she says i worry constantly about the people around me mm. it prevents me from falling asleep most nights and being mentally present throughout the day mm. my own life is very stable and calm though most of my stress comes from thinking about others. I'm truly and deeply distressed most of the time thinking about others. Mm. I also find myself hiding my needs or thoughts from people so as to avoid triggering these other people. Mm. I feel like a different person with everyone as I adjust myself to be what I think they need. Mm. And I, got, I get a lot of feedback from everyone saying how wonderful of a friend I am. Mm. It is seen as such a good trait by everyone I know, but I sometimes feel like I'm drowning my therapist says I need to focus on my own thoughts and feelings, but a lot of the time when I look inside, all I see are other people's thoughts and feelings. She also suggested staying out of other people's problems, but it's so difficult for me when I keep seeing them. Bob, what do you think? Yeah. Um, I like, I, I, I don't, I'm not saying it's easy, but I think your therapist is probably telling you uh, good stuff to do. Um, perhaps, um, your focus on how you feel and what you want that that's actually the chief focus in my own personal therapy um so there's a possibility that that's the case you could always inquire with yourself about the pseudo helpfulness that you find yourself engaged in because i know it looks like it's helping others it looks that way right because on the surface you know you're helping some old lady across the street or whatever it is helping your neighbor fix their car or something um but really what you're doing is something for you and whatever that something for you is that you're doing is hiding out in the shadows. Like that scene from The Wizard of Oz, you know, where Dorothy and the gang are standing in front of the big booming voice with the smoke and the flames and the whole thing. And, and they're all quaking. They're all scared to death. And then the dog runs over and it pulls this curtain aside. Toto pulls the curtain aside. And you see this kind of vulnerable little guy back there who does not want to be seen. And what does he do? He pulls the curtain shut and he says, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. And turns out that's the wizard. Mm -hmm. Like that's the actual guy. And you get to meet him. And, you know, he's a nice guy. He has no power, right? He's probably a little bit nervous. He's certainly not the big booming voice that he was before. Um, so perhaps there's some wizard inside you that does not want to step out from behind the curtain and be known and seen. And if you want, there's a possibility that with whether you know the answer to what do I want or how do I feel right now is irrelevant. The question is important and continuing to ask the question is important. And uh, my sense is that you'll discover something that in the worry about everybody else is something deep inside you that has need and deserves your attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. 
The only thing I'll add is I, I did a recent deep dive on codependency, and I would listen to that. There's also a possible. Well, no, it sounds it sounds classic codependent to me in that mm -hmm. uh, the. I, so I recently did a deep dive on codependency, uh, Bob. Um, let me ask you a question. Sure. So when you hear people using the word codependent in our field, even they'll be like, Oh my God, my client's co so codependent. What do you think they mean by that? Um, I think they mean like, like what this person wrote in to say, okay. I, I which, which is what, which are the qualities of what, um, um, being self sort of um, um, problematically selfless and focusing on the other person's need or want. Okay. All right. Well, that's actually the uh, definition of codependency in, you know, in essence, sort of, yeah. but a lot of times what I hear people using it on the internet anyway, and, and among colleagues is most of the time they're using codependent as a synonym for dependence for, for overly relationally dependent. Yeah. Because, you know, the word codependent came from addictions. It came from right. you are the co-pilot in someone's alcoholism. Right. You're not dependent on the person with alcoholism. You're just, you're the, someone's dependent on alcohol and you're the co-alcoholic. In yeah. fact, that's the, that's the original term was co-alcoholic, but they wanted to expand it to other substances. So they said, well, we can't say alcoholic anymore. We have to say chemically dependent. And so the, the co-alcoholic, we have to change to co oh co-chemically dependent but that's too long so we say codependent yeah. but dependent personality disorder is uh you know a label for people who are dependent on humans not not a substance a very no, different very different thing yeah. you know uh, a, a dependent person is someone essentially that is stuck at the age of like four where they feel like they can't do anything on their own and they're terrified as they should be at four but not at you know 35 yeah um whereas a codependent person is someone like this who is completely f obsessed with other people's problems. And when they stop and th focus on themselves, they don't see anything. Yeah. Uh, so it's a defense to focus on other people's problems. It's yes. a compulsion. It's a need. Yeah. And that is the essence of codependency. And I, in my deep dive, I, I, I frame it as a personality disorder because it's based on schemas, you know, yeah. and I differentiate it from all these things anyway. So I would, I would listen to that, that whole deep dive. I'm going to do a follow up, Lenny. Um, and I, maybe I should have saved this for that <laughs> because I, I asked people to email in about codependency and I, I was going to kind of review that. But the the cure is the cure for like any other personality disorder, which is to build awareness of your relational traumas and your impulses that shoot you in the foot. And, and two, corrective experiences to make you feel safe enough to focus on yourself. Yeah. And and because until you feel safe enough to focus on the self, you will compulsively and defensively focus on others because it distracts you and, and it makes you feel like you're worth, you're worth something, you know, yeah. your entire, as a codependent person, a, one of the common schemas is, is my only worth. In fact, you have said this before. My only worth is how useful I am to other people. Yeah. And so when I talk about codependency, does it, because I can imagine it going either way. Do you resonate with it at all? Yeah. How so? Well, I am a utility or so. I have been thinking for many, many years. And um, um, there's an absence of awareness of how I feel and what I want. And um, a lot of my efforts these days in my own growth and development are just paying attention to that. So like last week... I actually realized I was lonely. I had never noticed that before. Mm. And the way my loneliness was showing up was in irritation. And it was really fascinating to actually go slow enough to see that, oh, I'm lonely. I want something. As opposed to, why is Colleen blah, 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 you know, whatever. It's like, well, yeah, what, what, what's the beef, you know? Well, actually, it's that I'm, I miss her. I'm lonely. Interesting. Yeah. It was actually really cool. That was a good insight for me. And it was because of your growth that you could stop and pay attention uh -huh. to yourself. In the past, you would have distracted yourself by doing what? Um, focusing on her behavior and either being uh, attempting to be useful or being annoyed that I that she was not quote changing the way that she should. You know. Do you like, ever micromanage? Is that what you're kind oh, of? Oh <laughs> yeah, like the the man's planing with the pickleball. Ugh, it's embarrassing. I can be that way. Of course I can be that way, but I, I can with be. With Colleen. Yeah. 
about how she what like what do you try to micromanage like last night she was putting her computer together we had been out of town she took the computer with she came back home she was just assembling it and i'm standing there i walk in the room she's busy and she hits a snag and she starts fiddling around and i start saying well how about this and what about that and blah 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 she did not ask for any help and at some point i said to her I'm just the third wheel here. <laughs> you don't need any help. Let me know if you do, but I'm just going to vamoose right now. And she figured it out because she didn't need any help. And yeah, you know, right. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with being helpful. No, the helpful is great, but, but at, at the cost of you and also the compulsion yeah. to help can be annoying to other right. people. It's yeah. not real help. It's pseudo help. Yeah. It's fake help. It's like not real help. I need to help. Mm -hmm. You will let me help. Yeah. You better let me help. Oh my God. I had that one with her. I told you the burrito story, right? I don't think so. Oh, this is many years ago. 10 years ago. We're sitting on, uh, it's, uh, it's a Sunday. Colleen's working at the bank still. She'd been there for her whole career and she's being mistreated by her boss, this jerky privileged white guy. Um, my wife is, um, risen from bank teller to vice president and manager of her department. And she's completely self-made. She's an, a whiz. She's a master at what she does. And as a result of being a woman, she's being paid probably 25% less than a colleague who's a man who's on her same, you know, whatever level in the hierarchy is. Oh my God. And she has th three jobs. She actually literally has three jobs. That guy is just the one. And she has three jobs. And her boss is mistreating her. And me being a great therapist, it's like I've told her many times, well, here's what you got to do. Here's what you got to do. Here's what you got to do. Not really recognize what's going on. So there's this Sunday when she's complaining about her jerky boss again. And I can feel myself coming unglued. I'm getting so angry because, you know, I've given her very good advice. I've given very good advice about what she should do. And oh, you're coming in glued at Colleen. At Colleen. You're like upset that she didn't yeah. do what you She's told her to do. She's not doing what I told her to do. Right. And I know what's going to happen. It's like, I'm going to get really angry and we're going to have a fight and I don't want to do that. And it's burrito day. We're happy to be, we eat a lot in bed. So she And just to put a fine point on it, the sentence that's running through your head is, I love her. That's why I'm so worked up about it. Yeah. I'm trying to help. I'm just trying to help. And you're not doing what I told you to do. Right. But the, however but many the, times. But the driving fuel is... is um, what exactly is who am I if I can't help? Yeah. If you don't, if you don't let me help. Yeah. If you don't, yeah. By if you don't accept my, my help. By taking my good advice, like I'm going to decide what the help then, ought to be. Then what am I? What am I? I'm nothing. That's what I said to her. Instead of coming unglued, I left the room and I washed the burrito plates, which have that stinky film, sticky film on it. So, you know, there's hard to get clean. So it took me a couple minutes and I came back in the bedroom and I'm standing at the foot of bed. I know I don't want to pop, but I don't know what I'm going to do. And I suddenly started to cry. And I look at her and I say, is it okay if I will fix it? And she says, well, what do you mean? And I'm like, you know, to be honest with you, babe, if I can't help you, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know what you'd want to do with me. I don't know. I have no utility to you. And she says, you know what, Bob? No, you don't have to fix it. And I didn't marry you because you're good at fixing problems. I married you. I'm with you because I like you. I enjoy your sense of humor. You're good company. And I, I was both surprised. I was having my own Wizard of Oz moment. Stepping out from behind a curtain was this part of me that says, you're only as good as your utility. Mm -hmm. It's not like I knew that. I didn't know that. It came out of me. And as it's coming out of me, I'm watching myself going, what the hell is this? I don't mm. know this. This is new. I don't know this guy. Anyways, so she reassured me that, yeah, I, indeed, I do have a place there. I am supposed to be there. I, I am part of this family, and not because I'm good at fixing problems with her stupid boss, who mm. I still hate. <laughs> um, I, and, hate I hate him now, too. Yeah, well, rightfully so. Um, I have a picture of him in my head. Yeah? Douchey looking. Is he short? No. No. Oh. He was tall. No. Oh, yeah. Okay. Slick back hair. Gordon mm -hmm. Gecko. Oh, that would be gross. Yeah, no. <laughs> this guy wasn't that slick, but he was still kind of, I don't, no, I, I hate him. Yeah. Anyways, um, uh, she could have bitched about that job for three hours a day for the next month, and I would not have cared. I would have just sat there nodding my head saying, I know, he's a big jerk. Boy, you're being mistreated. Ugh, I don't know how you put up with it. And all the stuff that is all she really needs, right? which is just my ear, my care, 
my interest, my curiosity, not my solution. Mm-hmm. And, and indeed, I wasn't even trying to solve her problem. It was my problem mm-hmm. of what am I? What am I? What am I? That's so interesting. Yeah, when I was doing the deep dive on, and I'm glad you had that uh, healing moment. Thank you. And I'm really glad that she respond, responded perfectly. She did, didn't she? By the way. Um, that when I was doing the deep dive on codependency, I did not think of you. Um, I actually developed, as I, I was thinking of all the other people, I don't know why, you know, as, as I was talking, you know, just five minutes ago, and I was like, actually, you've talked about this before. But um, it's interesting that, uh, anyway, mm-hmm. so I, I developed three different types of codependency. There's, there's the sort of classic, which I, I, I called the helpful codependent, which mm-hmm. I think you qualify for. Yeah. The second type was the controlling codependent who, mm-hmm. you know, when the same driver driving force is there, but mm-hmm. instead of being like, I'm helping you will accept my help. Yeah. It's, I'm just going to control you. I'm just going to intimidate you into uh, doing what I doing say. What say. Oh, that's Cause I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to force you to do certain things because I know what's best for you. Kind right. of thing. And then the third oh, type was a assimilating or What did I call it? Uh, oh, I called it a chameleon codependent where you will just become like the person in their problem uh-huh. uh, as a way of trying to quote unquote manage it or focus on it. And, you know, so the chameleon is more passive and, and less sure of themselves. The controlling person is extremely sure of themselves. The helper is superior, but not arrogant in a, you know, not, not a, jerk about it not controlling about it yeah uh, do you ever dip into controlling oh, or i'm all three at some uh, time i'm probably the helper one more than any others but i can be all the others too. how so how so um i i can ha- i have a controlling impulse and i can sometimes be pushy and insistent i'd say it comes up most in my marriage doesn't really come up in other parts of my life in other parts of my life i'm, I'm more apt to be a chameleon oh. Tell let's break it down. So the sure. controlling give what's an example of so oh. because I, I think it's extremely important because there's controlling behavior and then there's controlling codependent behavior, which is again driven by that deep need to be helpful and yeah. to solve someone else's problems. Right. Because for my hypothesis was that codependents only feel safe, only feel worthy and connected to someone really or worthy of connection you know there, there's this prediction that goes on inside the the soul which is if i am solving this other person's problem then i am safe i will feel safe they will love me they will need me it will be connected yeah and whatever problem i think another aspect to it is whatever you know if i don't fix that problem in that other person, they will become too distracted by that problem and they won't be there to love me. You know, they, they'll be too stressed out oh, to, yeah. to pay attention to yep, me. Yep, I, yep. I need to solve their problem so they, they can be relaxed enough to actually pay attention to right. me. Right. Um, so when you were controlling, like as an example, was it driven by that? You know, I might, it might be that I feel a sense of controlling more than I do whatever Exhibit controlling it. person does. Like yesterday, she's loading up the car. She's putting a computer day yesterday. She's putting the computer screens in and she says to me, how do I move the seat? Because it was my car. And like, I tell her how to move the seat. And she's like, I don't know. I'll just do it this other way. So I go around the car and I move the seat. And she's like, Bob, you're in the way. <laughs> I'm like, okay, all right. I'm being helpful. Yeah, but not really helpful because it wasn't what she wanted. She didn't need me to figure out how to arrange her computer screens in the car so they could come home. Right. You know, I mean, come on. So that's not controlling. When I think of controlling, it's like, I mean, you could categorize it that way, but the typical behaviors I was categorizing under that label is, um, you know, abusing someone and, and, pushing them around and threatening, right. threatening them. Threatening like them. If, if you don't, you know, I guess using your example, it would be like, um, you don't know what you're doing with computers. I know yeah. this is my car and I'm going to do it because 
you don't know what you're doing here yeah. and you've screwed it up before. We all understand that, mm-hmm, yeah. you know, it, it pushes the target, what I call the person of concern or the under what's considered the under functioner into a position of dependency, dependency. often. Yeah. Um, whereas the helpful codependent is not necessarily pushing someone into a childish position, you know, no. but how, how do you chameleon to other people's problems? I think of one relationship where you might go to in your head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which one? Well, I, I can't say on the air, but okay. anyway, like what, what's it like to chameleon? Um, I try to be useful. I try to fit in. I'm a pretty good guest. I'm not a good host, but I'm a pretty good guest. So if I'm guest, I haven't guested at anybody's house like I used to. I used to be an urban nomad. Yeah. Have just a suitcase in my car and spend half my nights. Well, there's one thing about being a chameleon. And there's another thing about being chameleon codependent where you chameleon yourself because you're trying to connect with someone else's problem. You know, their alcoholism, alcoholism oh, their, yeah, yeah, yeah. their no. personality disorder. I don't, I don't do that. Yeah. yeah. I think that, you know, it's the, just being a chameleon is, is separate from okay. that. You know? Okay. There's, then, a, there's a style of being codependent that's, that, is co- that is chameleon. Like, I don't really do that. Yeah. Okay. Does that What's match how you know me? Huh? Does that seem true? Like, you know me. Well, you know, I, I, I've never framed you this way before, so uh-huh. I, I'm, I'm still kind of getting to know this. Oh, there'll be a deep dive on me. Huh? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that does it for that episode. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it.